As the seasons of the podcast have gone along, I've often asked you what you would like to see and hear on the podcast. And sometimes you've asked to know what's going on in the non-English language speaking world of haiku. This year, I've made time to do it. In fact, I've made it a priority. Now, I know some of you are not English language as a first language. And of course, you know that I don't live in an English speaking world. Although I do sometimes think that the Swiss could pass as native English speakers. Anyway, the point I'm making is that we native English speakers are incredibly lucky. There are very few places in the world that can't accommodate us linguistically. And so I often think we miss out on what's really happening in the non-English speaking world. So today I'm kicking off a series of podcasts on haiku in other languages. We're going to start in Europe because that, of course, is where I'm based. And more specifically, we're going to start with German language haiku, because that's my main second language. We'll hear a bit of history of haiku in the German speaking world. And obviously, we'll hear some haiku. But don't worry, I'm going to do my best to translate for you. Before we go on, have a think about this. Go to wherever you get your podcasts and give us a like, give us a review. And if it's YouTube, make a comment on the podcast itself. This will honestly help other poets to find us. We all want to spread the word about haiku and the joy of writing it, don't we? Don't we? So, German language haiku. Let's take a dive into what's been going on in that arena since haiku came to Europe. I'm going to divide the Germanic haiku development into three periods. The first is from its beginning to the Second World War. The second, the Second World War to roughly the 1960s, and then the 1960s onwards. Germany, of course, has seen much territorial change during this whole period of time. But in essence, I'll be talking about haiku in countries that speak German, which of course includes Switzerland, where I am. It's one of our official languages. There are four, in case you didn't know. Let's not forget that Europe came into contact with Japanese culture from about the mid 1500s when the Portuguese arrived in Japan. They went mainly for trading purposes with a bit of a side gig in missionary work. The Japanese were not too keen and kicked them out. And then the Dutch came along. Hendrik Dorf, a Dutchman, potentially wrote the first haiku-like poem, probably around the end of the 18th century. This was his poem, if you haven't heard it before. Lend me your arms, fast as thunderbolts, for a pillow for my journey. Lend me your arms, fast as thunderbolts, for a pillow for my journey. Hendrik Duff. There is documented work which suggests that in the German-speaking world, there was interest in Japanese poetry from the mid-1800s onwards, when August Fitzmaier, great name, August Fitzmaier, made the first German translations of Japanese short-form poetry. In this instance, he was translating Tanka. And his book, if you want to follow it up, of course, there'll be a link in the show notes, was the Beitrag zur Kenntnis der ältesten japanischen Poesie. Now that interest ramped up after the World Fair in Paris in 1896. Stefan Wulschutz asserts that this is where the perception of haiku as a special and separate liter literary genre began. Although, if we're to give credit where it's due, the French really led the way with regard to haiku in Europe. Is this the first haiku in German? Eine Wasserrose, die aus der Tiefe auftaucht, kräuselt sich das Wasser. Eine Wasserrose, die aus der Tiefe auftaucht, 
kräuselt sich das Wasser. And that's by Paul Ernst, who published it in Polymeter in 1898. But I do, of course, have a translation for you. And I've tried to translate it in a more contemporary style. A water lily emerges from the depths, rippling water. A water lily emerges from the depths, rippling water. And that was Paul Ernst, translated from the German by Patricia Maguire. Now, this water lily poem was published some time before the poem we're all familiar with, Ezra Pound's A Station in the Metro. The apparition of these faces in a crowd, petals on a wet black bough. The apparition of these faces in a crowd, petals on a wet black bough. And that was published in 1913. But even before Pound wrote this, the Germanic world continued with their interest in all things Japanese. Sabina Sommerkamp suggests that with Japan's victory in the Russo-Japanese War in 1905, interest in Japanese culture may have seen another spike, as it may have awakened a feeling of intellectual affinity and identity in Germany. Shall we have a look at some of the poems being written in this pre-Second World War period, which can be linked back to haiku? Hans Cantius travelled to Japan between 1914 and 1920, and as a result, wrote poems based on his idea of haiku, on what he'd learned there. They're often overlooked because they weren't published at the time. I don't believe they were fully published until they appeared in the anthology of German haiku, which was edited by Sakanishi, and that was published in 1978. So an example from Kansius would be Lauter, sing dein Lied Wind, schucht Frühling und Blüten Der Mond weint im Ried Lauter, sing dein Lied Wind, schucht Frühling und Blüten Der Mond weint im Ried I'm sure you'd like to hear a translation. Lute, sing your song. The wind chases away spring and blossoms. The moon weeps in the reeds. Lute, sing your song. The wind chases away spring and blossoms. The moon weeps in the reeds. That was Hans Cantius from the 1920s, translated by Patricia Maguire. If you look at that, you'll see that we can recognize that as something haiku-like in terms of contemporary haiku. It talks about a season. It's very much about nature. It's in a form that we'll recognize, if you look at the German anyway, as 575. And from what I can see from Mr. Kansas's poetry, he does tend to stick to 575. But there are rather too many verbs for my liking. What do you think? Now, the next one is by Reina Maria Rilke. He took a very different view. He was very, very excited by the idea of haiku and wrote this one to one of his friends at Christmas 1920. Kleine Motten taumel schauend queer aus dem Buchs. Sie sterben heute Abend. Und werden die wissen, dass es nicht Frühling war. Kleine Motten taumel schauend queer aus dem Buchs. Sie sterben heute Abend und werden die wissen, dass es nicht Frühling war. And the translation? Small moths tumble shuddering across the box. This evening they die and we'll never know that it wasn't spring. 
small moths tumble shuddering across the box. This evening they die and will never know that it wasn't spring. A haiku written by Rilke in 1920 and translated by Patricia Maguire. I think perhaps he got himself a little bit overexcited, don't you? That first line alone, whether in English or in German, could be the length of a modern day haiku, couldn't it? Let's move on. Maria säugt das Christkind und hinter ihr an einer Schnur blähnt sich im Wind die Windeln. Maria säugt das Christkind und hinter ihr an einer Schnur blähnt sich im Wind die Windeln. And that's by Franz Blei in 1925 and a translation for you mary nurses the christ child and behind her on a rope nappies billow in the wind mary nurses the christ child and behind her on a rope nappies billow in the wind and that's a haiku by franz Bly from 1925, translated by Patricia Maguire. Fünf Kontinente zittern, wenn der Kornpreis steigt, und nicht, wenn du weinst. Fünf Kontinente zittern, wenn der Kornpreis steigt, Und nicht, wenn du weinst. And that's by Ivan Gol in 1927. And a translation for you. Five continents tremble when the grain price rises, and not when you cry. Five continents tremble when the grain price rises, and not when you cry. A haiku by Ivan Gol, translated by Patricia Maguire and dating from 1927. I find this one very interesting. It's a very interesting time in history, isn't it? And I wonder, is this one of the examples of the first social history haiku? We see quite a lot of them today, but I didn't see many when I was doing my research. Now that gives you an inkling of what was being written from the late 1800s through to the Second World War. Yet as the war began, a very important book, as far as German haiku is concerned, was published. Ihr Gelben Chrysanthemum. A book in which Anna von Rottauscher translated the work of the masters. Of course, we're quite familiar with some of the works therein. Flog da ein welches Blatt zurück zu seinem Zweige. Ach nein, es war ein Schmetterling. Flog da ein welches Blatt zurück zu seinem Zweige. Ach nein, es war ein Schmetterling. And that, in case you were wondering, was Moritaki, translated by Rotasha in 1939. And if we translate it, it would be something like this. Fallen blossom returning to the branch. Oh no. A butterfly. Fallen blossom returning to the branch. Ah oh, no, a butterfly. That's Moritaki, translated by David Lasmina. I knew that one by Moritaki, but reading through Rot Rottausha, I got to learn some new ones, and I thought I'd share this one with you. 
Der Effu rauscht in herbstlichen Wind. Der Effu rauscht in herbstlichen Wind. And that's my Kakai, translated into the German by Rottauscher for her book in 1939. And if you'd like a translation, of course. The leaves of ivy, all of them quiver in the autumn wind. The leaves of ivy, all of them quiver in the autumn wind. And this time that was translated by Hoshino, Sunihiko, and Adrian Pinnington. Now, of course, this book didn't come out at a very fortuitous time, did it? 1939. We're probably all aware that the world was to be in uproar for the next six years. And even then, even after that, it wasn't really stable for some time. Yet this book was to have a considerable influence in the German-speaking world. Now, von Rotheischer, it's been suggested, had a dual purpose with this book. On the one hand, as a sinologist, she was translating the work of Japanese masters for education, for her own purposes. But on the other hand, it's been suggested that Ihr Gelbem Chrysanthemum was part of the literature of the inner emigration. So she was expressing an opinion. Now, this body of work in the inner immigration movement was considered to be the work of creatives who took an attitude that was critical or even hostile toward national socialism. These creatives were unable to or didn't want to leave Germany during the time of the Second World War. Their work, though, was often sidelined potentially worse. But luckily for von Rotteuscher, her book was subtle in its approach and not so well known at the time. Rotteuscher's translations didn't concentrate on the syllable count. Overtly, she was taken by the element of nature in haiku and saw the poems in terms of seasons. Her translations are written in three lines, in a free form, and in her book, they're divided on a seasonal basis. Almost a quarter of the translations that she made are by Basho, and it's in her thoughts on him and his poetry that we can perhaps derive the biggest clues that her work belonged in this inner emigration canon. She sees Basho as a wandering monk, a spiritual man who's turned his back on the world to concentrate on his experience of nature. Further evidence of her subtle criticism of National Socialism was her choice of haiku, many of which, at least in her translations, concentrated on the spiritual or on loneliness, often this loneliness expressed in spiritual terms. Her book and its translations suggest that nature is idyllic, that a spiritual outlook in combination with nature is the ideal which contrasts with the events in and around her homeland. You know, the industrial efforts for the war, destruction of people and places, a lack of empathy in society for the spiritual. Here's another one. Viel Vergessenes kommt vor die Seele wieder, wenn die Kirschbaume blühen. Viel Vergessenes kommt vor die Seele wieder, wenn die Kirschbaume blühen. And that's another Basho translation. Which, if you'd like to hear it in English, is this one. When the cherry trees blossom, many memories return to the soul. When the cherry trees blossom, many memories return to the soul. And I've translated it, I hope, in the spirit of von Rottoisch's translation. But I have another one for you. And this one was by... Jane Reichold, and she, of course, is translating straight from Basho, without the intervention of the German. Many various things come to mind, cherry blossoms, 
Many various things come to mind. Cherry blossoms. And another one, Basho, translated by Monrot Teuscher. Welch unendliche Einsamkeit. Nur das Serpen der Zikaden dringt durch den Felsen. Welch unendliche Einsamkeit. Nur das Serpen der Zikaden dringt durch den Felsen. What infinite loneliness. Only the chirping of the cicadas penetrates the rock. What infinite loneliness. Only the chirping of the cicadas penetrates the rock. That one again by me, translated by me. Loneliness seeping into the rock, cicada's voice. Loneliness seeping into the rock, cicada's voice. In my translations, which are a translation of von Rotreusch's German, you can see the spin she's giving to her translation. Her choice of words in both these translations are more spiritual or highlight the loneliness more than Reichhold's. Of course, Reichhold is coming directly from the Japanese. I thought that was quite interesting. So how did this book influence haiku writers after the war? We shall see. Margret Bürschepe credited the beginning of the next period of haiku development in the German region as the publication of Der Schmale Weg. 203 Seilige Gedichte, The Narrow Way, 203 line poems. And this book was by the Austrian Karl Kleinschmidt, and it was published in 1953. Kleinschmidt followed the example set in von Rotteusch's book of translation. His poems were written in three lines, in a free form, and used seasonal references. Einzelne Birche, goldenes Laub, weiße Wolken im Blauen, schmale Weg ins Unendliche. Einzelne Birche, goldenes Laub, weiße Wolken im Blauen, schmale Weg ins Unendliche. And I've translated it as lonely birch, golden leaves, white clouds in the blue, narrow path to infinity. Lonely birch, golden leaves, white clouds in the blue, narrow path to infinity. Now, there was another poet influenced by von Rotteuscher, and this was a Swiss one. Flandrina von Salis. Erblühende Rose, nie zu fassendes Wunder, göttliches Ahnen. Erblühende Rose, nie zu fassendes Wunder, göttliches Ahnen. Flandrina von Salis. And an English version. Blooming Rose, a miracle that can never be grasped, the foreshadowing of the divine. Blooming rose, a miracle that can never be grasped, the foreshadowing of the divine. That was translated by P and H. Massey. Now in this one, you can see that von Salis has been inspired by nature, as well as the spiritual, as per von Rotteusch's translations. But I have another one for you. And in this one, she has put more emphasis on nature rather than the divine. And look what, I, look what we can see. Well, listen, and you might be able to hear it. The 575 form has appeared. And this one's from her book, Moonblüten. Blei grauer Himmel und nichts als eine Möwe als silberne Pfeil. Bleigrauer Himmel und nichts als eine Möwe, 
I'm still gonna file. And in English, lead gray sky and nothing but a seagull as a silver arrow. Lead gray sky and nothing but a seagull as a silver arrow. Look, there's a bit of a no-no in that one, isn't there? Simile, as a silver arrow. But we'll forgive her. It was 1955 after all. The 575 form, which I hope you heard in this poem, this form is going to be cemented in a book often recognised as a major influence in the development of German haiku. Irma von Bodmuthoff's Haiku, and that was published in 1962. I've got some poems from that book for you. Das alte Mühlrad vom Wasser hell übersprucht, es dreht sich wieder. Das alte Mühlrad vom Wasser hell übersprucht, es dreht sich wieder. And in English, bright water sprays over the old mill wheel. It turns again. Bright water sprays over the old mill wheel. It turns again. Von Bodmershoff's work generally uses a 575 structure. In the writing of haiku, she came to the conclusion that in der Zahl 17 ist ein Kraft enthalten die durch nichts anderes zu ersetzen ist. That is, in the number 17, there is a power that cannot be replaced by anything else. I know there are other poets out there who feel that way about the traditional form. Now, von Bodmershoff's work speaks of nature, often featuring a season, and you can hear a cut in her work, at least mostly. We would certainly recognize it as haiku. It did have an impact on the haiku written in Germany between 1962 and 2004. Can you believe it? Such a period of time. Unterm Schnee friert der Feuerbaum und verliert sein Rot im weißen Moor. Unterm Schnee friert der Feuerbaum und verliert sein Rot in weißem Moor. That's by Karl Heinz Kurz. And in English, the flame tree freezes under the snow and loses its red in the white moor. The flame tree freezes under the snow and loses its red in the white moor. So in this poem, in the German version, you can see traces of von Bodmershoff's influence, the 575 form, the seasonal word, and I think you can hear the cut, even though it's in the middle of the second line. Just a little pause between Feuerbaum and Und. Could just be my ear, though. Karl-Heinz Kurz was inspired to write haiku because of his travels. He often travelled in Japan, apparently. And he was instrumental in the setting up of the German Haiku Society in 1988. In this haiku by Uli Becker, which was published in the 1980s, he uses the honkadori technique to allude not to a Japanese poem, but to that of a poem by William Carlos Williams. This is just to say. Could this be evidence that the German scene is now reaching out to influences outside its borders? Ihr Kuss ein Echo, der Flaumen aus dem Eischrank, so süß und so kalt. Ihr Kuss ein Echo, der Flaumen aus dem Eischrank, so süß und so kalt. And that's from his book. Fräulein Butterfly, the 69 haiku. And in English, her kiss an echo of the plums from the fridge, so sweet and so cold. Her kiss an echo of the plums from the fridge, so sweet and so cold. 
And if you're not familiar with William Carlos Williams's poem, this is just to say, here it is. This is just to say, I have eaten the plums that were in the icebox, and which you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me. They were delicious, so sweet, and so cold. Great honkadori there from Uli Becker. In 1988, the German Haiku Society, with its quarterly journal of haiku, was formed with Margaret Buerschapa as its first president. She retained this presidency for 15 years. Can you imagine? 15 years. Which Klaus Dieter Wirth suggests was significant in the evolution of haiku in the German-speaking arena. He suggests that during this period, the German haiku world of the society was rather secluded, failing to take on board work that was taking place internationally, failing even to work alongside German Japanologists of the day. Now, I cannot attest to the truth of this, but what I can tell you is that in the main, between 1962 and 2004, haiku poets writing in German, or writing for a German-speaking readership, I should say, tended to more or less keep to the traditional 575 form. Martin Berner, on taking up the quarterly journal in 2004, appears to open a discussion with the members of the German Haiku Society as to what should be considered the haiku form. He goes so far as to say, Was ich ablehne, das sind Dogmen. What I reject are dogmas. Now, on taking up post, Martin Berner and his colleagues worked hard to change things. For example, they changed the name of the Worsley Journal to Zomagras, and the new journal accepted a wider variation of haiku. There were fears at the time that these changes of outlook may result in a decline of membership of the German Haiku Society. Nonetheless, Martin Berner forged ahead and cemented international contacts that he and one of his colleagues from the Frankfurt Haiku Group had been developing. He even instigated the first European Haiku Festival, which took place in Germany in 2005. Shall we have a look at some haiku from the German Haiku Quarterly Journal in March 2004, before the change in outlook? Kar Freitag Wetter, sonnig und klar. Das Kreuz wirft mächtige Schatten. Kar Freitag Wetter, sonnig und klar. Das Kreuz wirft mächtige Schatten. And that's by Conrad Miesen in 2004. And an English version for you. Good Friday weather, sunny and clear. The cross throws powerful shadows. Good Friday weather, sunny and clear. The cross throws powerful shadows. Now, if you look at this poem in the German and analyse its content and structure, you can still see the influence of the 17 syllable 575 form. And I don't know about you, but the poem looks and feels a little bit forced to me particularly with the way it's punctuated. So in the first line, there are five syllables. Kar Freitag Wetter. Kar Freitag Wetter. There are seven in the second line. Sonnig und klar. Full stop. Das Kreuz werft. Sonnig und klar. Full stop. Das Kreuz werft. And then the final line, another five. Mächtige Schatten. The poet, Miesen, has punctuated the poem and structured the content to fit this form. Today, we'd probably say to him, have another look at the poem. Write a freestyle. And I wonder, would he have chosen his words differently? The style of von Bodmershoff's haiku is evident in this poem. 
And you can also see the influence of von Rotteusch's translations in the chosen topic of his poem. Miesen is not von Rotteusch's wandering monk, but he is the spectator at a religious event and combining nature with a connection to religion. So the spiritualism is coming through as well. Reading this, one of the last German haiku society journals prior to its name change and the official change in outlook, you'll find that the majority of the short poetry within it are the traditional form, often forced into that form with punctuation. But things were changing. Bleibt tot ernst, trotz meiner Grimasen, die Nachrichtensprecherin. Bleibt tot ernst, trotz meiner Grimasen, die Nachrichtensprecherin. And that's by Daniel Dolschner in 2004. Translated into English. Remaining deadly serious despite my grimaces. The lady newsreader. Remaining deadly serious despite my grimaces. The lady newsreader. And Martin Berner wrote his own haiku in this journal, which clearly signals to his readers the possibility of that change in outlook, away from the stilted traditional model. Frühlingsmorgen. Leicht die Treppe steigen. Frühlingsmorgen, leicht die Treppe steigen. Martin Berner, 2004. And in English, we translate it something like Spring morning, lightly climbing the stairs. Spring morning, lightly climbing the stairs. What do you think of his play on words? A spring in your step. I thought it was positively charming. So Martin Berner, he's making these changes. And eventually in 2009, he hands over the society to New Blood. He'd achieved a level of understanding with the membership so that it no longer rejected freestyle haiku. I wonder how far he was aided in that quest by the possibilities of exchanging ideas by the internet. And what part did the European Union and, and Germany's emigration policy play in bringing new ideas into the German-speaking region's haiku? For whatever reason, it's around this time that German haiku took a leap in its evolution. And I have some final examples for you. Spätherbst, schwere Tautropfen auf den Gräsen. Spätherbst, schwere Tautropfen auf den Gräsen. And that's by a poet we hear often on Poetry P, Deborah Carl Brand. And it was in Autumn Moon in 2023. Translated like this. Late autumn, dew drops heavy on grass blades. Late autumn. Dew drops heavy on grass blades. And this one by Martin Berner again, also from 2023, but this time from the German online journal Chrysanthemum. Kriegsnachrichten, ein Milanpaar, sieht seine Kreise. Kriegsnachrichten, ein Milanpaar. Sieht seine Kreise. War news. A pair of kites makes its rounds. War news. A pair of kites makes its rounds. Nessen Dorma. Der Tenner schraubt sich in den Beifall. Nessen Dorma. Der Tenner schraubt sich in den Beifall. Friedrich Winzer, also from Chrysanthemum in 2023. Translated, Nessun Dorma, the tenor spirals into the applause. Nessun Dorma, 
the tenor spirals into the applause. I wonder what our trio of ladies, von Rottteischer, von Bodmershoff, und Frau Boyerschaffer, would think of these new poems. Sticking with the idea of translation, the word essay from the French, what does it mean? Well, in case you don't know, it means to try. And I've tried to show the evolution of German haiku since its arrival in European shores. Have I answered my initial questions over the last two podcasts? Just to remind you, when did haiku come to Europe? How did it evolve in Germany specifically? What did it look like in the various stages of its evolution? And what influenced its evolution? In some respects, I think I have answered the questions, but in the way of researching something, I'm left with even more questions, a curiosity to delve deeper into certain matters. What role does history have on the development of a creative form? Why are certain ideas or certain genres such as haiku taken up at a particular time? What is the impetus? Are creative forms influenced by a national psyche? Does such a thing even exist? If a national psyche exists, what difference does history, the coming of the internet, or mass immigration mean to it in terms of creation, in creative forms, that is? And what role does a translator play in the evolution of a form such as haiku? Now, Michel de Montaigne, the French essayist, felt that humankind does not operate in certainties. And I think that rather than give you certainties today, I've given you a curiosity to explore with or without me the form haiku takes, where your ideas of haiku come from, and what influences the form your haiku take. If you have answers to those questions, or even more questions, perhaps you'll share them with me. So, that's it for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've enjoyed the ideas and the poetry. If you could support the work the podcast does with a donation or by signing up for one of our membership schemes, I'd be awfully grateful. Details are on the website. Don't be a stranger. Do email me with your thoughts on all matters haiku. Till next time, keep writing. You will find bits and pieces in the show notes. If there's something missing, you know what you have to do. Just tap me out an email and I'll get back to you. Ciao.